Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us here today. I want to welcome my colleague, uh, Audrey Gordon, the Minister of Health and Seniors Care and Minister of Mental Health, Wellness and Recovery, as well as Dr. Jazz Atwal, our Deputy Chief Provincial Public Health Officer, and Dr. Joss Reimer, Medical Lead of Manitoba's Vaccine Implementation Task Force to uh, today's COVID-19 update. Uh, first off, I want to commend our teachers, administrators, and education support staff for the additional work and adjustments that they've made to prepare for the return of in-person learning next week. Thank you for your willingness and your dedication to adapt to keep our children engaged during this remote period. While we know our children are incredibly resilient, we recognize that this week and certainly uh, the past two years have been incredibly challenging for students, parents and caregivers as we implement the necessary measures and protocols to help keep schools safe for our kids. We know our children and youth learn best in school, uh, in, in a school setting, and I am pleased to confirm that K-12 schools will open for in-person learning on Monday. Our government's number one priority is to protect the health and well-being of all Manitobans, especially our most vulnerable citizens. Throughout this pandemic, Manitoba has implemented earlier and for a longer duration some of the most stringent public health orders in the country to help protect our hospitals and our communities. Earlier this week, I was pleased to speak with the Prime Minister and my provincial and territorial colleagues <clears throat> for our first virtual meeting of the new year. The focus of our discussion was on the current COVID-19 situation and the common challenges our jurisdictions are facing as a result of the Omicron variant. As provinces, we called on the federal government to significantly increase the supply of rapid tests and vaccines to support our local ongoing efforts to mitigate the spread of this virus. We know Canadians from coast to coast to coast are struggling. We recognize the significant impact the pandemic has had on our physical, emotional, and financial health. We must learn to live with this virus. There must be a balance. As Manitobans, we all have a role to play. Follow the fundamentals. Mitigate your own risk and get fully vaccinated. As a government, we will continue to build on initiatives to build up our health care system and provide the tools and systems necessary to help limit the spread of this virus and protect the most vulnerable people in our communities. As of today, two new COVID-19 testing sites have been established to help improve access for Manitobans seeking a PCR test, as well as to meet the increasing demand for the rapid antigen tests. The first new site, located at 820 Taylor Avenue, will be available by appointment only starting tomorrow and Manitobans, for Manitobans to pick up rapid tests. The second new site is located at 1300 Redonda and will offer PCR tests only to eligible Manitobans uh, as of today. PCR tests will be seven days a week by drive through with no appointment necessary. For more information on these sites and all provincial testing sites, visit manitoba.ca slash COVID-19. As we are currently processing over 4,000 tests a day, we are committed to making tests more accessible and getting results to Manitobans as quickly as possible. I'm pleased to share that the average turnaround time for a PCR test <clears throat> is now well under 48 hours, with some test results available within a day. Additionally, we continue to expand our COVID-19 rapid antigen testing programs and as supply from the federal government increases. It is expected that by next week, eligibility for rapid tests will include all designated staff in critical service areas who are symptomatic and work directly with clients and vulnerable populations. We recognize the significant pressures the pandemic has had and continues to have on our health system. I want to express my continued appreciation for the incredible dedication and hard work of our team of healthcare workers. We, we depend on all of you and we are so grateful. We know you are tired and Omicron pressures add to the urgency to find solutions. You may recall we announced plans last year to increase the speed 
at which we, we could hire internationally educated nurses to provide care to Manitobans. Building on the successes of bridging programs for internationally educated nurses, we re we, uh, which have resulted in new nurses embarking upon careers in rural Manitoba, we offered new funding to help internationally educated nurses assessments and training. More than 1,360 applicants met the basic eligibility criteria to take the next steps in becoming nurses in our province, and we are working with these applicants to get licensed here. Some are already working within the health system in Manitoba at other jobs and are ready to be licensed and, get, uh, and, and take on greater responsibilities within our healthcare system. We hear stories about nurses who have qualified in other provinces but have not yet been able to secure licenses here in Manitoba, which we are working to address. Healthcare employers are very eager to support internationally educated nurses to continue their careers as nurses in Manitoba as soon as possible. And we've been in discussions with the Manitoba Nurses Union and its leadership supports this initiative and we look forward to working with them on this. We will be challenging the College of Registered Nurses of Manitoba and the College of Licensed Practical Nurses of Manitoba to ensure we license as many of these applicants as soon as possible. We need to be innovative and flexible while maintaining standards of requir and requirements. These individuals come from a variety of training background, which is why we need to work together to find the best pathway uh, to registration as a nurse in Manitoba. Manitobans expect this sense of urgency and our dedicated healthcare workers need more assistance and support. As a government, we are committed to providing additional support and staffing help as we continue to navigate these unprecedented COVID challenges. And with that, I will pass it over to my colleague, Minister Gordon. Thank you, Premier Stephenson, and thank you as well to Dr. Atwal and Dr. Reimer for joining us today. And good afternoon to all Manitobans. We're here today to provide an update on the current COVID-19 situation in our province. And as you know, for almost two years, the COVID-19 pandemic has challenged our health care system. As the situation has evolved in our province, so has the way we report the information. This has been true since the earliest days of COVID. Going forward, we will now be putting a greater focus on system load and not new cases. Because we know the number of positive cases in Manitoba is substantially undercounted. With the Omicron variant, the health system continues to meet multiple times every day, reviewing the latest data and assessing staffing levels and patient needs. One of the early trends we're starting to see in this wave that we haven't seen in previous waves is that only one third of Manitoba's COVID positive hospitalizations are being hospitalized because of COVID. The other two thirds are being hospitalized for another medical reason, but happen to be COVID positive. It is more important than ever that we continue to monitor the data, identify, assess, and address our system needs in this ever-evolving landscape. We need to ensure that we continue to have ICU and hospital beds available, and that we're working to support Manitoba's current and anticipated health system needs. This includes contingency planning to manage the increase in staff calling in sick during this fourth wave. Now, some of you may remember the story I shared with you shortly after I, I was appointed health minister of the little girl that I met in my constituency of Southdale who shared with me that she could only play with her friends through the fence. And I just want to take some time to talk about the mental impacts on individuals living in our province. Because it's important to remember that the impacts of COVID-19 are far reaching and have caused significant unintended impacts, including the decline in mental health. A recent Statistics Canada survey on COVID-19 found that one in five Canadians aged 18 and older experienced symptoms of depression, anxiety, and other post-traumatic stress. 
In a survey conducted by the Mental Health Commission of Canada, nearly half of youth respondents reported feeling isolated due to not seeing loved ones, either through social gatherings or school environments. You are not alone in this. With the ongoing effects of the pandemic, our government has ensured there are programs available for those of all ages that are seeking assistance. For more information on local crisis and non-crisis mental health services available by region, I encourage you to visit gov.mb.ca slash health slash mh. The Strongest Families Institute also provides skill-based programs to serve Manitobans of all ages as an ongoing effort to support pandemic-related anxiety and mental health issues. Since the start of the pandemic, Strongest Families has helped over 1,800 Manitobans through these programs. Adults can self-refer to Strongest Families by calling 1-866 470-7111. And children and youth programming can be accessed through their Regional Health Authority, the Manitoba Adolescent Treatment Center, or their primary health care provider for a referral. We've said many times that there is no health without good mental health. And good mental health is maintained by strong support networks, staying connected to our loved ones, and communities can ensure not only the well-being of others, but ourselves. We can, and I want to em emphasize the word can, we can get through this together. Manitobans must continue to do their part by getting vaccinated, by booking your booster shot or your first or second dose, you are not only protecting yourself, but you're keeping your friends and family safe. You're protecting your co-workers that you see on a daily basis, your community, the person in the grocery store, the person who pumps your gas, and most importantly, you're protecting our health care system. You're protecting the many frontline workers who are working so incredibly hard to keep our province healthy and safe. And I'll end my comments, and thank you very much for listening, and I'll now pass it to Dr. Atwal. Thank you, Premier. Thank you, Minister Gordon. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jaz Atwal. I'm the Deputy Chief Provincial Public Health Officer for Manitoba. The COVID-19 pandemic has been an ever-changing situation that has required all of us to adjust our lives and make significant changes. How public health responds to the pandemic is no different. We have frequently had to pivot our response the emergence of the Omicron variant is no different. It is more transmissible than the original virus or any other variant at the present time. When COVID-19 first emerged, for every one person infected, there may have been three or four people infected with the Delta variant. With Omicron, one person might infect 12 to 16 others. By the time you have tested positive, you've likely exposed others to the virus. They may be symptomatic already, and they may be already exposing other people as well. Omicron has a much shorter incubation period than the original virus and other variants. The median exposure time to when symptoms appear used to be four to five days for the Delta variant of concern. With Omicron, it's three days. COVID-19 is no longer an emerging illness. It is here to stay and our ability to contain the virus is limited. It is highly likely that everyone will be exposed to the virus in the coming weeks. Some Manitobans will have immunity from a previous infection or vaccines. This will make COVID cases less severe, but the sheer number of cases still has the potential to overwhelm our healthcare system, which is something we are monitoring closely. Like seasonal influenza, we have to adjust to working, learning, and living with COVID-19 circulating in our communities. One of the ways we need to adjust to COVID-19 and Omicron is case management. Given the transmissibility of Omicron, it is not possible to manage cases at the individual level. We have to focus on managing the risk at the community level. We have to shift to mitigating the impact of COVID-19 and away from containing the virus. Shifting our approach does not mean public health has given up the fight against COVID-19. It means we are shifting our approaches to focus our efforts and our resources to best manage the risk. This includes focusing on providing vaccines through additional appointments and shifting staff, as well as identifying those eligible for treatment. The best way to protect yourself, especially if you're a high-risk individual, 
is to get vaccinated and to get boosted. While the Omicron variant causes less severe disease overall, it can still result in severe disease for some people, particularly those that are unvaccinated and have high risk conditions. We need to support our healthcare system so people can access care they need by focusing on measures that reduce the likelihood of someone developing severe disease. Monoclonal antibody treatment is now available and new antiviral treatments are emerging. We're also trying to identify cases at higher risk of severe outcomes. We have implemented measures to test all people with symptoms and we continue to increase the availability of rapid tests to specific sectors and to critical service areas as announced Tuesday. This will not only allow us to refer people for treatment as needed, but also enhances access to testing, enables Manitobans to return to work sooner and protects vulnerable Manitobans. Additionally, we're continuing to provide advice and guidance to schools and the business community. In addition to getting vaccinated, there are many other ways you can help mitigate the risks of COVID-19 and the Omicron variant. Practice the fundamentals like physical distancing, wearing a good fitting mask, hand hygiene, and staying home when you are sick are all measures that still work. Following public health orders will also help reduce the number of exposures. As we transition our public health practices, it remains important for everyone to continue monitoring for symptoms like we have since the beginning of the pandemic. If any symptoms develop, self-isolate and get tested. Two new testing sites in Winnipeg were announced today that will further assist with this capacity. If you test positive, isolate according to public health orders. Notify your contacts so they can be extra vigilant in monitoring for symptoms and seeking testing. There is still more to learn about the virus and its severity, and we continue to review the data to learn more. And as we learn more, we will adjust our approaches to identify those most at risk and mitigate the effects of COVID-19. Thank you, and I will pass it over to Dr. Reimer. Thank you, uh, Dr. Atwal and uh, Minister and Premier. Um, I'm Dr. Joss Farmer, Medical Lead for the Province's Vaccine Implementation Task Force. And this week, I would like to start by sharing some new data. So just wait one moment uh, for us to get the slide up. So last week, uh, I was asked how booster doses compared to zero, one, or two doses in preventing severe outcomes. We didn't have that information uh, last week, but today I'm very thankful to our epidemiologists for doing this analysis and putting together these graphs today. Uh, so I'll spend some time on uh, the third graph, but first, this first one just shows us the difference in risks when it comes to whether or not someone is vaccinated with one, two, or three doses when it comes to their risk for hospitalization. On the next slide, uh, we see a very similar pattern uh, for ICU admissions. And I'll spend a couple minutes on the ICU one to demonstrate what we're learning about cases in Manitoba. So on this graph, we can see that someone who received one dose of the vaccine is three times less likely to end up in the ICU compared to someone who is unvaccinated. If you have had two doses, you are 19 times less likely to be admitted to the ICU. And after the booster dose, we are seeing that people are an incredible 139 times less likely to need ICU care than someone who is unvaccinated. On the final slide, we have the same uh, graph looking at uh, the risk of death related to um, COVID-19 and by vaccination status. And again, we see the same pattern where those people who have had one and then two and then three doses have increasingly lower and lower risks of these severe outcomes. The vaccine is not providing the protection we had hoped against Omicron infection overall, but this data that uh, comes from December uh, and is Manitoba data is very reassuring about how we can continue to protect ourselves against ending up in the hospital or worse. Uh, if you are over the age of 50, you are at increased risk for severe outcomes. These charts show just how important it is for you, especially if you're over 50, to get your booster dose. If you have health conditions, and many of us do, 
like diabetes, heart disease, COPD, cancer, and many others, you are also at higher risk. And so we want you to get the benefit of these vaccines, whether that's your first, second, or your booster dose, to be able to reduce the chance of these severe outcomes for you. So moving to uh, a different topic, I am encouraged that since Health Canada approved the Pfizer vaccine for children aged 5 to 11 uh, in November of 2021, parents and guardians have been doing a very good job of getting kids in for their vaccines. As of yesterday, over half of all kids in this age group in Manitoba have had their first dose. This is great progress, it's so impressive, and I'm so thankful to these parents, but we want to see even more. Recently, I have also been hearing from parents who are concerned about the recommended timing between the first and second doses for this age group. So I will speak to that today, but first I wanted to highlight that Health Canada's approval for younger children was based on a clinical trial involving over 3,000 young children receiving the Pfizer vaccine. The study found that the vaccine protection level against symptomatic COVID-19 was over 90%. So this is similar to the level of protection that the vaccines provided for older children and adults. The study also showed that uh, if immunized and children, uh, if immunized children did get infected, they experienced milder illness. This is still the case, even with Omicron now representing the majority of cases uh, around the world, but particularly here in Manitoba. Some children, unfortunately, do become very ill. And even if they don't, they can still easily spread the virus, infect someone who has less protection or less immunity, and cause more pressure on the healthcare system. So there are many reasons to vaccinate, both for your child, for their friends and their community. If your child has not yet received their first dose, we will be returning to schools uh, as soon as in-person learning resumes, uh, which the Premier just said was uh, next week. So please watch for when a clinic comes to your child's school, as we do uh, have clinics that will be running around the province. Going back to the concern of, of the uh, timing between dose one and dose two, in the context of the spread of Omicron, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization re-examined the interval between first and second doses for children aged five to 11 to determine if a shorter interval would pr provide more protection. NACI determined that eight weeks was still the recommended interval. Manitoba's Pediatric Vaccine Advisory Committee also reassessed their recommendation. So they met last week, and they also have reaffirmed their guidance of an eight-week interval between first and second doses. So I've heard from many parents who want their child to get a second dose of the vaccine sooner before they return to school. I'd like to take a few minutes today to explain why NACI and Manitoba's Pediatric Vaccine Advisory Committee still say that eight weeks is best. The committees weighed the very real concern about the spread of Omicron against the known benefit of waiting eight weeks between doses. Children are already at a much lower risk of severe outcomes compared to adults. Combining this with the lower severity of Omicron overall, we do know that most children who are infected will do very well. But I don't wanna downplay the situation. There is rapid spread of Omicron in Manitoba right now, and we know that some children will experience severe illness. So the question is not whether or not the vaccine is helpful. The question is, will pushing up dose two for our children lead to better outcomes or could it lead to worse outcomes for the children of Manitoba? Children with one dose are not without protection. A recent vaccine dose, even if it's your first one, will still trigger an immune response. Children had a robust immune response in the original trials, and so we expect that even if the, full, the first dose may not provide the full benefit of two doses, it's still very helpful. We expect that the first dose will prevent the majority of severe illnesses in children. We saw in the graphs that I showed earlier that one dose already greatly reduces severe outcomes even for adults. 
And that graph was looking at all people who had one dose, regardless of the timing of that dose. With our children, they've had a recent dose, and we know that protection is greatest from two weeks to about two months after receiving a dose, which is the timeline that our kids are facing right now. Finally, we don't know what might be coming next. We don't know how long Omicron is going to circulate in our communities. We don't know when, if, or what kind of variant might circulate in our communities in the future. So while there's no question that we want children protected against Omicron, we are also trying to think about how to give them the best possible protection in the months to come, because we know that COVID is here to stay. The committee also recommended that most children who are immunocompromised should still wait eight weeks between dose one and dose two. As of now, provincial clinics, doctor's offices, pharmacies, community clinics, and public health will continue to reinforce this recommendation. However, in some circumstances, it may be possible to shorten the duration between first and second doses for this age group to a minimum of 21 days or three weeks. I would ask parents to discuss their concerns with a health care provider. And if parents bring their children to our clinics earlier than eight weeks, the clinic staff will discuss the individual circumstances with the parent or guardian to determine the next steps for that child. I know how stressful this is. I can tell you that every single parent on the on Manitoba's Pediatric Advisory Committee feels anxious like you do about protecting their children. But I can also tell you that every single parent on that committee is waiting eight weeks before giving their five to 11 year old a second dose. So next I wanted to share some disappointing news that we heard about vaccines for children under five. Their children under five are not yet eligible for a vaccine. And I know for many parents, the vaccine can't come soon enough. But unfortunately, right now, it looks like these younger children won't be able to get protection from a COVID-19 vaccine until well into 2022. Pfizer has reported that two doses in their trial did not bring out the same strong immune response in this under five age group as it did with older children or adults. So they have announced that they're amending their clinical trial uh, for children who are six months of age up to five years to add a third dose. And this will take more time. Moderna is also working on a vaccine for young children under the age of six, but we haven't yet received any information about what their trial has found at this point. We will keep you updated on this, but for now, I can say that it looks like we will be waiting a while for a vaccine for children under the age of five. Moving on to our province's older children, um, children, teenagers who are 12 to 17 are eligible for first and second doses of Pfizer. But we have not yet received guidance on third doses for youth in this age group. None of the Canadian provinces are currently providing booster doses for teenagers. But NACI is looking at this situation and we're hopeful that we'll receive guidance from them soon. In the meantime, uh, again, like we were talking about before, I know how anxious parents are feeling with uh, children returning to school. So I do want to stress that we see that two doses continues to provide strong protection against severe outcomes. And with youth already being at low, lower risk of these severe outcomes, most of them are still very well protected against ending up in the hospital, ending up in the ICU. Shifting topics um, a little bit, I wanted to provide some clear direction for those people who have been recently uh, infected with COVID, uh, who may have symptoms or are waiting for test results, but are also due for their next dose of the vaccine. If you have an appointment for your next dose and you recently tested positive for COVID, you must follow all public health orders and complete your period of self-isolation prior to attending the appointment. Please reschedule your appointment until after you have finished your self-isolation and your symptoms have resolved. If you are symptomatic, but you have not gone for testing, 
you should assume that you are infected with COVID and follow that same guidance. Anyone with an appointment they can no longer attend are asked to go online or call the vaccine call center to rebook. At the very beginning of the vaccine campaign, we told people with a recent infection to wait three months before getting their next vaccine dose. This was because we had a very limited supply of vaccines at that time, and we wanted to make sure that people who had no immunity at all uh, were prioritized over people who had some immunity from their infection. This is no longer the case today. We've seen that infections with Delta or previous variants do not protect well against Omicron. So you should not wait three months before coming for your next dose. So the summary is, please make sure you've recovered from your infection, that you don't have symptoms, and you've finished your isolation before coming to any of our clinics, pharmacies, or any other location to get your vaccine. You don't need to drop everything and run to the clinic the day that you feel better, but please don't wait three months. I'd like to also address today uh, what to do if you are thinking about travel plans in the future. I've heard from some people who are worried uh, about the advice to take Moderna regardless of what you received in the past if you're over the age of 30 and how that could be a problem for future travel. So I have a few things that I want to say uh, about that. And the first is that protecting yourself now is crucial. Please don't make vaccine decisions based on the ever-changing landscape of different rules in different countries that uh, changes from day to day to day. Depending on where you plan to go, there will be different vaccine requirements. In many places, a mixed schedule is already acceptable. In the USA, for example, you are considered fully immunized if you received any mixture of the vaccines that we offer here in Canada. So please get your second and third doses when they are recommended uh, and think about travel uh, when that becomes uh, a closer issue for you. So with that, I will hand things back to Premier Stephenson. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reimer and, and Dr. Atwal, and, and, and also to Dr. Roos and your teams for keeping us up to date with the most recent uh, information that we have out there for Manitobans. While our current public health orders uh, remain unchanged and in place uh, for the next couple of, uh, next three weeks, we will continue to consult with public health and with others in the community to, uh, to monitor the data as well as, as it impacts our health system. Vaccines and uh, following the fundamentals is our way through this pandemic. Vaccines work, and now more than ever with the Omicron variant circulating throughout Manitoba, it's crucial that all Manitobans get fully vaccinated, including the third dose when you're eligible. Just a reminder to Manitobans to follow the fundamentals, stay home when you're sick, get tested, get vaccinated. You know, wear a mask, so socially distance, and limit your close contacts. The next few weeks will be challenging, there's no question. We're not alone in Manitoba, though. People are facing this across the country and around the world. We will get through this together. Please be patient, and uh, we, we will get through this together. So with that, I will uh, open it up for questions. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Atwal. Um, Last week's uh, announcement that it would be the continuation of the status quo in terms of public health orders, was that the recommendation from public health or was there a recommendation for more stringent public health orders? So just on the public health orders, I'll start off with that. And certainly, um, you know, we have to take a balanced approach, as already has been said by Dr. Atwal as well, that, that we need to, um, we're, we're going to need to learn to live with this in the longer term. Uh, COVID is, is here to stay and we're going to have to live, you know, longer term. So we need to take a balanced approach when it comes to this and look at the long term and what that means. And so certainly, you know, we, we know that people are suffering from mental health issues. We know that uh, our seniors are, are living in, in isolation. Um, we know that businesses are suffering as well as a result of this. And so, you know, of course, you know, we, we have already the most, some of the most stringent rules in place. We put those in, in place also, just a reminder, earlier than, um, than other provinces. Just a reminder that we went to level orange with respect to 
um, you know, the, the, the levels. And, uh, you know, just last week, some of the, the other provinces were announcing that they were going into orange. So I think because we were proactive, because we took those steps, those measures to put uh, more stringent rules in place earlier on, that we are where we are now. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, we won't look at things in the future, but this is where we're at right now. Could you answer the question? I think from a public health perspective, we provide information to everyone that we deal with, including government. I think from what we're dealing with right now, you know, Omicron is a different virus, essentially. It's behaving differently, it, it, you know, than what we have had uh, circulating before. Um, you know, it, it's uh, um, length of stays in hospital is lower, the risk of hospitalization compared to Delta is lower, uh, risk of ICU admission is lower as well. And, and we're focused here on, on, you know, we not only do have orders in place, but we have our messaging in place as well. So public health has done a lot to shift our strategy to deal with Omicron as well. Uh, so our testing strategy has been changed, our case and contact strategy has been changed to deal with this virus that is circulating widely within the community. Uh, so, so we are shifting our approach in how we're managing Omicron, and we're going to continue to try to mitigate those issues for Manitobans. So was whether you recommended something stronger. So again, uh, we we. Question, <laughs> Doctor Atwell. Was there a recommendation from public health for more stringent measures last week? So our discussions uh, occur uh, with governments. We do provide recommendations to government, and I think anything further would have to come from government in relation to uh, answering your question important in this and when you look at other provinces and 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 this is the way it's been for certainly other provinces maybe not necessarily here from the beginning where it was uh, really um, you know a lot of, of emphasis was, was put solely at the the feet of, of public health and that's a lot of responsibility in one place and I think what we need is to go and have a more balanced approach moving forward so we will I certainly have been reaching out to business community you know we, we know that pediatricians were out um, you know earlier this week talking about the importance of getting kids back to school these are this is all of the advice that we need to get from professionals out there so it's not just falling at the feet of, of public health at the end of the day we'll take advice from public health but we will be um, taking advice from from other Manitobans as well moving forward again we're having to shift and today is about a bit of a shift where we need to start looking at longer term and how we're going to live with this with this uh, uh, with this virus, and uh, I think you know it's not just something that's unique to Manitoba; it's a, it's across the country. Can you tell us? Can you tell us then if public health recommended more stringent measures? Well, I think every day we're we're bouncing ideas back and forth, and and what what we can, what can we do? You know, I mean, every day we're we're trying we're getting new information. Um, you know, today we receive information that you know, you're 139 times, you know, less likely to end up in ICU if you get the third dose. There's more information coming out every day that we need to take into consideration. As government, we're policymakers, and we have to take advice from, from everyone, including public health. And so, you know, but those are, those are ongoing discussions that we have. It's not just one point in time where here's more, you know, restrictions that need to be put in place. But you want to answer the question? I think I have answered the question. Well, did public health recommend more stringent uh, measures than what was put in place? Public health is, is constantly, we're, we're constantly um, working with public health every day, new ideas. You know, we could, you know, we could do this, we could do that. But I will say that, um, you know, as policy, we are, we are policy makers as government, and it's up to us to ensure that we take a balanced approach moving forward. We have to shift from looking at this as, you know, uh, you know, the virus, you know, j just, just today. I mean, this is going to be with us longer term and we need to shift that way. And just a reminder that we did have the most, some of the most stringent rules in place uh, earlier on with respect to this. A reminder that last August we were in code orange and in level orange when it comes to the pandemic. You know, just last week Ontario went there. So each and every day we'll take the information that we get um, from public health, from our healthcare system, from businesses. I mean, we need to listen to other doctors, mental health issues that, that Manitobans are facing. And they're facing that because of, you know, some of, some of the restrictions. So we're going to have to take a more balanced uh, approach. Are you not giving up though by shifting away from containing the virus with, with more, over 100 people 
of all causes in ICU now. We're, we're close to the edge now on our ICU system. Are you not, are you not giving up uh, if you're shifting away from containing the virus to trying to manage the numbers that we know are continuing to increase? Well, I think we already have a lot of you know, restrictions in place. Let's not lose sight of that. You know, so we have those in place. Those restrictions are in place. The fact of the matter is, and, and certainly the doctors can, can talk about this you know, uh, uh, more and, and can elaborate on this, but this virus is in our community. It, it, it is spreading. It's very, spreading very quickly. But reminder that we already have you know, among the most stringent rules in place if you look across the country. So um, I don't know if anyone wants to answer the, the question just around the, the spread, Dr. Al. Sorry, what the premier last week you said you're going to be laser focused on hospitalizations and ICU, ICU admissions. Well, since then, there's you know, from 251 people being hospitalized to today, it's 454. Last week on Tuesday, there were 32 people in ICU. This week, as of midnight last night, there were 49. So, if you're laser focused on hospitalizations and admissions, you know, at what point do you? Do you act, or is this just letting nature take its course now? No, I mean we continue to be laser focused, and Minister Gordon may want to ask, mm -hmm. uh, may want to elaborate on this. We continue to be laser focused on on ICU numbers, and that's why we are encouraging all Manitobans to go out and get that third dose. I mean we can see from Dr. Reimer's uh, uh, slides today that people are 139 times less likely uh, to get, you know, into to to end up in ICU as someone who is not vaccinated. We need to ensure that Manitobans get out and get vaccinated and get their booster shot. I don't know. Uh, yeah, so Minister, thank you, you want to Madam Premier. I, I don't want the message to Manitobans to be that we've somehow lost sight of what is happening in hospitals and ICUs. We are meeting on a daily, hourly basis. Perhaps when we go back upstairs after this press conference, there will be another meeting. And so that is why we have this Recharge Your Im Immunity campaign that has gone out because we received that information that Dr. Reimer mentioned today about how important that third doses in terms of recharging your immunity and keeping you out of hospital and if you do enter our hospital that your stay is is for a very brief period of time and if you're at home with COVID um, that you have mild to moderate symptoms and 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 recover very quickly so we are focused on what is happening in our ICUs as I mentioned in my comments earlier some individuals that we are seeing in our hospital numbers entered hospital not because of COVID they may have been there preoperatively and as part of their pre-op testing, they were tested and found to be positive but had no symptoms at all. And so we are seeing a range of, of changes and evolving um, circumstances with how the Omicron variant is, is revealing itself in ICUs and, and in our hospital setting. But uh, by no means do I want the message to be to Manitobans that we're not paying attention to this because we always do every day. And we are talking to system leaders um, in, in every morning and, and finding out what is happening overnight, uh, what, is, what are we seeing. We are doing chart reviews as well. And I should share that with you. We are, are doing chart reviews to uh, assess where we see the Delta variant, where do we see the Omicron variant showing up, what percentage of individuals, as, as I mentioned in my comments, are um, presenting to hospital for other reasons but tested positive. That is important information. So we are paying attention to what is happening in the system and we are supporting our system leaders and our health care workers. Well, the ERs where people are seeing the hallways are filling up with people waiting and there's apparently just one ICU bed available after a really busy 24 hours. Like aren't we at the brink now where there's got to be like a um, a lockdown or a circuit breaker or something? I mean, what do you do now? I guess it's good that you're managing it, mm. but, but how can you manage if it's overwhelmed? Well, the, we, 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 we do see the, the escalation in, in the numbers of people that are presenting, but um, you mentioned that there was only one uh, ICU bed. I'm not aware of that. From what I understand, I think we're at 105 cases today and we have 116 beds in, in the system as of today. And we're continuing to work with uh, system, health system leaders to ensure that we can respond to the needs of Manitobans. So our message today is that the way that you stay out of the ER hallways 
and the way that you stay out of our hospitals and our ICUs is to recharge your immunity by getting your third dose. And if you haven't had your second dose and, and waiting for your third, then you need to get your first and your second. That is how you help yourself, your friends, your family members, and all Manitobans. And, and, and it, it's not by lining up in, in the ERs. Um, we, we want to, to emphasize the, the need that the way out of this COVID uh, pandemic is through vaccination. Minister Lord, mm. what is happening at, at HSC? We are hearing of patients waiting in ERs for hours because they can't find a bed. What's happening at the hospital? So what I, what I would suggest that these individuals do, we have no backlog in our testing sites at, at the moment. The Premier mentioned that for, for lab tests, they're being returned in under a, a day, uh, 10 hours, 11 hours is what I'm, I'm hearing, is that the individuals access their tests um, and, and, and do the testing and if they feel that uh, they can recover at home. We do have a very effective COVID outpatient management program. There are 60 spaces in the program. The last time I was updated, there were only 22 officials, uh, patients or clients, sorry, in the COVID outpatient program. They can be monitored for their symptoms and told when it, um, it's the right time to be at the hospital. So in some situations, people uh, may not be aware of that, but there is a COVID outpatient program that would prevent you having to, to uh, go to hospital and, and wait. But we are continuing to work with shared health and health system leaders to ensure that Manitobans have access to the care that they need in our hospitals. We are, are very actively, as, as you know, Ian, engaged in level loading and ensuring that individuals who no longer require the care of our acute care facilities are moved to appropriate levels of care and so that we free up those beds and those spaces for the patients that we don't see. As a vaccine mandate, they've been part of your conversations. So certainly uh, I know that that was mentioned uh, nationally and I, I was on a a uh, uh, first minister's uh, meeting with the prime minister uh, earlier this week and uh, you know we had uh, discussions not so much around uh, around that I know uh, but but certainly um, you know it was it was uh, I think other provinces have sort of said that that's not the way we we want to go uh, with respect to that um, in terms of making mandatory uh, vaccinations I don't know how you would roll that out I think the Prime Minister himself sees what the challenges are around that as well and so I think you know what's important here is that we encourage uh, as many Manitobans, as many Canadians to get vaccinated as possible. I think when you see the numbers that Dr. Reimer shared with us today, uh, I think it's it's compelling uh, the the reason why you need to go out and get vaccinated because it will it's saving lives. There's no question about that. We're going to jump to Zoom. We'll jump to Zoom and we'll come back to the room. Okay. Thank you. A reminder to our reporters on the line. You will have one preliminary and one follow-up question. Up first this afternoon from the Brandon Sun, Karen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just getting back to uh, talking about uh, thinking about long-term management. Uh, you just wondering, like, is there like a strategy in the works for something like that, or are we just uh, just waiting and seeing how Omicron plays out? I mean, from the public health perspective here, we have orders in place to help limit those interactions with individuals. We've had measures in place for a long period of time. We're going to continue to have those measures in place as well. And, and think about that as a speed limit. Right now, you know, the speed limit's at 100. It was slippery this morning. I didn't drive into the city this morning at 100. I, I slowed my speed down. So we're also messaging to people to slow down, to limit those interactions with people. Uh, you want to, you know, if you're allowed to, or if you're planning on having, you know, 10 different activities you're doing this week, cut them down to five, cut them down to two, limit those interactions at an individual level, and that'll help mitigate some of the risk related to COVID-19. The messaging is also for those, if you are at risk of having a severe outcome, not only get your first shot, get your second shot when you qualify, get your third shot of the vaccine as well, and also really limit your interactions and really think about who you're interacting with. 
Um, you know, is it safe for you to interact with those who are unvaccinated? And you have to make some of those individual decisions as well. We've shifted our approach on the testing side because we knew Omicron has a shorter incubation period. It is much more infectious. So we're not in case and contact management trying to contain the virus. What we're focused on is case management, mitigating the risk at an individual level who is higher risk and having them or allowing them easier access and accessing treatment options. So right now we have monoclonal antibodies, that is one treatment option. Soon, uh, once we get Health Canada approval, we'll have antiviral medication available for those who are at higher risk as well. Again, we still talk about masking, we have testing. Uh, um, so these are all the things that people have. People have lots of tools that they can use to help mitigate that risk. So, so public health had to shift because the virus changed. Let's face it, the virus changed quite dramatically on us in a short period of time. And like I said at the beginning, this is almost behaving like an entirely different virus. Shorter incubation, much more infectious. We would not be able to contain this virus. So we have to learn to live with this virus. One of the positives coming from this virus is it has much less severe outcomes, especially if you're vaccinated. So this is the importance of vaccine. Also, the same measures we had in place for other variants like Delta or Alpha or even the wild type still work here. This is about our interactions with people and limiting those interactions. So everyone can do that at an individual level. You could do it at a family level and at a community level, things can be done as well. And leaders can do this as well in different businesses or different settings as well. So there's lots of opportunity here to limit those interactions. And also, if you are at higher risk, you have to really think about a, your vaccination status, and who do I interact with? Not only within your own family, but with others in public. And that'll really help mitigate some of the issues here. We have widespread community transmission. We want to try to limit the number of cases generated over a short period of time. All these tools will help do that so our acute care system has less risk of becoming overwhelmed. So we're asking everyone to do some of those things that people can do at an individual level. Thank you for that. Uh, my follow-up, um, with uh, uh, schools returning, uh, what have you done to make the return to school safer for uh, staff and students? So just on that, I, I think I'll, I'll take that question. Um, I know that uh, uh, Minister Cullen will be out tomorrow with a further announcement on, uh, on the education side of things. Uh, but certainly uh, we know that more than 500,000 uh, uh, tests have been already handed out to students to, uh, to take and for testing before they get back into the classroom. Another 200,000 will be delivered next week. Uh, we know that uh, the vaccines will be offered in schools as well uh, next week as well, starting next week. And so that will be good and we hope to get um, those students uh, vaccinated uh, who aren't yet vaccinated. So um, those are the types of, of things that, that are put in place. Um, there were other measures that were put in place and they needed some time to just put various, um, various uh, things in place to ensure they need a little bit more time to put those things in place. The, you know, those stakeholders asked for that and, and so we, we offered that. Some wanted a, a month to do that. We didn't feel that that was appropriate. And we felt the most appropriate thing, frankly, was to, to just phase people back into school. Just a reminder that the kids are in school today. Those of essential service workers are in schools today. And so it was a phase back approach. So they're in school this week and then and, and others are remote learning. But starting next week, all students will be back uh, in school in learning. Okay, thanks. From CJOB, Skyler. Hi there. Uh, thanks for the time this afternoon. So <clears throat> I think some people will hear this news conference and they'll be uh, glad that there weren't any additional restrictions. And some people are really concerned about themselves or someone they love catching COVID and uh, will be unhappy that stricter measure wasn't taken. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm all for reducing personal risk. And I, I think that message can be understood by most people, but there are situations where you simply can't do that. I'm just thinking of, you know, say like a grocery store cashier, they still have to go to work every day and, and punch the clock to try to make a living and, and they're exposing themselves to the virus. And it's not as simple as reducing their contacts in a situation like that. Conversely, healthcare workers, uh, I'm sure there are countless uh, healthcare workers listening to this today, um, you know, don't hear that any further action has been taken and they've been working their butts off for a couple of years and are, are very upset right now. So I'm just wondering, 
uh, what, what would you say to someone who, you know, maybe putting themselves at risk of the virus and really doesn't want to, but has no choice? And then also, what would you say uh, to the good doctors and nurses of Manitoba? So certainly I'll, I'll start with that. And, and I think what's important is that Manitobans look after themselves. I mean, this, this virus is running throughout our community and, and it's up to Manitobans to, to look after themselves. Uh, you know, Dr. Atwell has talked about some of the things to, you know, go back to the fundamentals, wear your mask, you know, wash your hands, all of those things, get vaccinated. This is what's going to keep you and, and others in, in the community safe. And so just a reminder to do that. And I think it's, there's also a reminder out there that we do have some of the most stringent rules in place and, and restrictions in place right now. And so we need to remind Manitobans about that. I think because we haven't been out announcing every day like some of the other provinces have, like some of those provinces are, are uh, reaching the levels that, that we are at and, and we have been for some time now. And I think it's really important to remind Manitobans that we took those early measures, we put them in place earlier than many other provinces. And so it's important to remind them of that. You know, restrictions are, are one thing, but we need to ensure that, you know, vaccines and other things out there will also help. As Dr. Atwell talked about, there's many different tools out there that Manitobans will be able to uh, use. And so we need to, to focus on that as well. I also think it's important to um, to look at some of the changes that uh, the business sector has made on their own without restrictions. I, I know there are many business establishments. You'll see signs on the door where they're limiting the number of individuals that can come in uh, to the establishment at any uh, given time during their open hours. There are some that have, have said um, we will only do uh, takeout and, and no in-person dining. So establishments are taking this very seriously. We, we will remember back in 2020 and, and earlier this this year, business community spent a, a, a lot of money on plexiglass and uh, reducing the number of, of seats in their establishment. So uh, back at the grocery store, I'm starting to see um, uh, someone standing at the door and saying, you know, can you uh, sanitize your hand? They're wiping down the, the carts again. So they're taking it very seriously. and. and um, I want our healthcare workers to know that we value and appreciate you. We are working with health system leadership to ensure that you're protected. Uh, we are listening to you. We are talking to, I had a really good discussion last week with Darlene Jackson, the president of the Manitoba Nurses Union. We're collaborating in, 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 in many different discussions and ways to get help into the system, such as what the Premier mentioned around our internationally educated nurses. So we hear you. We understand the incredible burden and stress that you're under. And, and we are working with health system leadership to alleviate some of those pressures. And we thank you and, and value all the efforts that you're making during this difficult time. Okay, thank you, you two, for those answers. I just want to circle back to something you said, Minister Gordon, about businesses taking measures into their own hands. The issue with a, a restaurant, say, closing their doors to takeout is that they're killing their own business, right? People can't go and sit in their own dining room. And they're doing that on their own accord because they believe uh, that's the right thing to do, but the province isn't taking that action for them. And when the province doesn't take that action for them, there's no support. So I, I'm just, I, I don't understand how a business could take, uh, you know, action further than the, what the government is uh, saying and expect to survive in this climate. Well, what is happening is that we're creating that flexibility within the business sector for individual businesses to decide how they protect their, their staff and how they protect their, their clients. And in, in doing so, we are also making supports available. There's a portal open now that is accepting applications from business owners. They can apply up until January 31st for supports if they decide to pivot and make changes to the way they provide services to their clientele. So what we're doing is, is uh, creating that flexibility, recognizing that this pandemic and COVID will be here for a very long time. 
And so how do we live with it? How do we ensure uh, our healthcare system continues to function? How do we ensure children continue to, to be in school, in school learning? And, and how do we help our business sector? As the Premier said, it's a balancing act. Uh, and, and so those supports are coming alongside the business sector when they make those decisions to ensure they continue to operate. But the, the virus is going to be with us for a very long time. We need to work together. And, and I think there are many people, sometimes I see it on social media, they say, I haven't tried it myself, but there's something called DoorDash, and they're saying, I just went to DoorDash and ordered from this establishment. Let's support some establishments this, this weekend in terms of ordering. So I see Manitobans are coming around all the different stakeholder groups to say, how can we get through this together? And that is what we need to do, is to work together listen to each other, uh, be compassionate, be understanding, and, and do what we need to do. Individuals, family members, and many different sectors need to do this together. From the Winnipeg Sun, Ryan. Hey, everyone. Um, with businesses, you know, announcing their own restrictions, I suppose, as Skylar was saying, um, does that not maybe indicate to you guys that more restrictions are needed um and you know i would take issue with more with manitoba being very strict uh, as far as i know in ontario you can uh can't dine in at any restaurant you can still do that here in manitoba yeah certainly um that's one area like, like there are supports in place for businesses now and so i think it's important to remind manitobans of that to suggest that there aren't is is wrong and they were there, we made those announcements up to $22 million in extra supports just a few weeks ago and uh, in response to, uh, to uh, the need for that in the community. And we will continue to work with businesses towards what they need to ensure that we can get them back up and running eventually when it's safe to do so to ensure that we can grow our economy here in Manitoba. We will have to see the light at the end of this tunnel. There will be a light at the, at the end of this tunnel and we will get through this together one step at a time. By no means am I saying today, or are we saying today, that we won't see, you know, potentially down the road, you know, other restrictions in place based on the evidence that we receive, you know, from public health, but from the modeling, um, you know, if we see those, then we will act on those. So we're not saying today that we're, that we're not gonna be acting, this is, you know, on, on those uh, measures as we receive the evidence. I also think it's, it's important to remind Manitobans that uh, our province was uh, the first province to, to put forward a, a immunization or what we refer to as a vaccination card that, that is, it applies across the, the province and to all individuals and, and are protecting. So those are restrictions that apply to everyone. If you're unvaccinated, there are places that you cannot go, you cannot dine in, you cannot be at a gym. So we have restrictions in place. Please don't get the impression that we don't. We do. And, and we need to also create that flexibility within various sectors for stakeholders to make decisions about how they provide services to their clientele. And there, please don't give the impression that there's no um, indoor dining because that does continue in, in many establishments. And there are some that are doing takeout and some that are doing a combination. And, and what we need to do is to support those sectors and support each other through this very difficult time. I guess as a follow-up, uh, maybe for Dr. Atwal, as far as the hospitalizations uh, go, is, are you going to be adding the kind of numbers of people who are in hospital for COVID and uh, people who are in hospital who weren't there originally for COVID but contracted it in hospital? Is that going to be added to the dashboard? So work is being done to do that at the present time. I mean, first, it's right now we've gotten some preliminary information with a manual check. So, so someone is going through each one of the charts and looking to see what the reason for admission was. And at the present time, about 33% of the emissions from one facility and on the pediatric side, uh, COVID-19 was that diagnosis for it. So, so again, greater work's gonna be done on this. This is challenging. This isn't just challenging for us. We've been asking for similar numbers from other jurisdictions right across the country here and even internationally. And everyone's challenged with that same uh, um, 
thought uh, of trying to get that information, trying to get really precise information on, in relation to the risk of Omicron and hospitalization. Uh, so again, continued work will be done on that, and, and hopefully we are able to uh, tease that information out on an ongoing basis as well. From CBC Radio Canada and Charlotte. Hi. Um, do you expect to follow Quebec on the health contribution for people that are unvaccinated? So we'll continue to monitor again what uh, what uh, restrictions that we put in place or various uh, measures. We're certainly not looking uh, at anything like that right now. Uh, it doesn't mean that we won't be looking at uh, ways to encourage more Manitobans to get vaccinated because we see the numbers today uh, of why it's a very compelling reason certainly to get vaccinated. So we'll continue to, uh, to work with all stakeholders. So what incentives would you put in place? So we already have a number of restrictions in place, as, as Minister Gordon was just saying uh, earlier. Uh, of course, we have our, and we were the first province to implement a, implement a, a vaccine card. And uh, we know that uh, those who are, are not vaccinated cannot uh, attend certain, uh, cer cer certain restaurants and so on. And so there are restrictions already for, for those uh, unvaccinated out there. From CHVN, Taylor. Hi, good afternoon. Dr. Adwell, can you just explain what that shift to managing the risk at the community level will actually look like? So we've talked about it a little bit already. So I, I know this is challenging. We've been doing something a certain way and, and, and you know, the virus changed. You know, we've had some challenges all along throughout the pandemic dealing with, let's say, Alpha, then Delta. Uh, and now we've got Omicron, which is behaving very differently. So we have shifted, again, our, our case and contact management is very different. Just because this is such a short incubation period, it is much more infectious. We won't be able to contain this the way we did Delta, the way we did Alpha. And even those situations, you know, we've talked about this for every case we diagnosed, we missed four. Here, we're missing a multiple of them. So, so we have shifted over to managing more on the cases side and the contacts will be known to uh, be identified by the case by themselves. In high risk settings, public health is much more involved as well. Um, on the testing side, we're focused on testing strategy to those who are at higher risk and in high risk settings to learn and to be able to uh, mitigate issues in those high risk settings. And also for those who can access let's say a anti uh, a mon like a, a, sorry a monoclonal antibody treatment right now and in the future an antiviral treatment uh, that would happen in an expeditious fashion so those changes have already occurred and we're going to continue to look and fine tune those changes as well and we're asking people again to get vaccinated because you know with looking at the data that is one of the best ways to protect oneself from having a severe outcome and we're going to continue to monitor that situation and make adjustments as time goes on. We've adjusted all along and we're going to continue to look at the evidence and make those adjustments for it. And I understand this is challenging. This is a, a pivot. We are shifting what we're doing from a public health perspective, from a, a, a messaging perspective, from a, a you know, case and contact and testing perspective. And, and it is a challenge. I think it's a challenge for all to adjust to that, but it's for the right reasons. It's for, uh, you know, mitigating issues in Manitoba in relation to COVID-19 in a, in a fashion that is, is suitable for the circumstances that we're in, in relation to how this virus transmits. Thanks. And, you know, the phrase living with a virus is being used pretty often, but it's really salting the wound for families who lost loved ones to COVID recently and the ones who will be in the upcoming weeks. As we keep seeing, you know, hospitalizations get higher, deaths increase. Why is this balance not focusing more on things like giving out rapid tests and the rest of those KN95s to the average Manitoban? So just on the uh, the rapid tests, we know that uh, we have asked for, for more. Uh, there is a supply issue. I know that uh, in our first minister's meeting this week, I asked the prime minister and, and, and indicated to him that certainly Manitoba has an order in for uh, for more uh, for more uh, rapid ant antigen tests. So um, I know it's there's a there's a supply issue, and we'll continue to work with them towards that end. And, and we 
we are taking steps. So as the Premier mentioned, we are opening two new um, sites where you can pick up your, your PCR test, the Manitoba Hydro location on Taylor, and I think the other was R R Redonda. Uh, and we acted. The moment uh, we saw the increase in the, the need for tests, we, we started to, to look at other ways that we could ensure Manitobans receive their test results quickly. We signed a contract uh, so that we could get those lab tests back to individuals as quickly as possible, reduce those lineups. And that's why we're, see, we're able to report today that we have no backlog and that results are, are being provided in under a day because we are acting. We don't want Manitobans to die. Our goal is to save lives, and that's why we talk so much about vaccination. And that's why I consider myself to be a vaccine ambassador, because everywhere I go, I continue to send that message out about the importance of getting your vaccination. So it, 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 we, it, it's, we, I extend my condolences to all family members uh, that have lost a loved one. We take this very, very seriously. And our way out of this is to encourage your, your family members, your friends that you may know that are not vaccinated to get their vaccination to prevent deaths, such as the loss that you may have experienced. But we do take it very seriously. From CBC National News, Cameron. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Premier, just in terms of talking about a shift here, and I guess the stance now for your government as, as you're in charge, do people need to be shifting their expectations? Are we simply, clearly, and bluntly saying to people that they should expect to uh, contact COVID here over the course of the next couple of months and whether or not it makes them sick? I think what we're asking Manitobans to do is to ensure that they get vaccinated, vaccinated that they mitigate their own risk out there uh, to not contract this, this virus. And so, um, you know, we will continue to, to work with Manitobans to encourage as many Manitobans to get vaccinated, to get their booster, to get tested, to follow the fundamentals. That's what we have been doing. We have restrictions in place. That's part of the, the, the balancing act here. We need to ensure that businesses have their, um, the necessary supports that they need to get through this. We need to ensure that Manitobans have the necessary supports to get through this. And we will get through this together. That doesn't really answer my question. Should Manitobans expect that they will get COVID in the next couple of months and in your message about vaccinations and masking and distancing? We've been saying that now for over a year. What today gives us the expectation that more people will take up that message than did a month ago? That's a really good question. And I think Manitobans and Canadians and everyone is exhausted from this virus around the world. Uh, this is nothing that's, of course, unique to, to Manitoba, but, you know, again, I think the, the important thing here is to reduce your individual risk of getting the virus. So I'm not saying that everyone's going to get it. If they reduce their own risk of, of getting it, follow the fundamentals, get vaccinated, all of these things, then, then they'll reduce their own risk with, and, 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 you know, hopefully not end up in the hospital, which is uh, what obviously the, the vaccines are, are helping to reduce the number of people in, you know, that could end up in hospital and certainly reduce the number of people in ICU. From CHTM, Navi. Good afternoon. Uh, Premier, you mentioned earlier that uh, rapid tests are on short supply. I was wondering if you could speak specifically to the distribution of rapid tests in northern Manitoba and uh, what that process looks like or entails uh, when uh, compared to the rest of the province. Yeah, we can get more information on the distribution and what, what that will look like uh, from northern Manitoba, but I think it's the most important thing here is that we do, we are short of supply with respect to those, uh, the tests, and so we need to ensure that we get more of that uh, from Ottawa. Um, but we can certainly uh, follow up on that and, and see what that means for northern Manitoba and when you can expect to see that. All right, and uh, my follow-up is in regards to the uh, indefinite closure of the Leaf Rapids Health Center and what the province is doing to address that situation and when uh, we can expect that center to reopen and at what capacity considering the surge in COVID-19 cases. 
So the, the Northern Regional Health Authority did uh, in, inform Shared Health of the need to temporarily, and I, I, I emphasize that, uh, 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 stop services in, in Leaf Rapids. It, it is due to a staffing issue, and um, they are working on on plans to restart the service there as, as quickly as possible. So we're monitoring these temporary closures and ensuring that individuals are being redeployed. But as we've done in, in the past, we are taking a provincial approach to some of those local issues. And uh, healthcare professionals are, are, are working together and um, they're, they're being redeployed to areas of greatest need, and we will continue to do that in the weeks uh, ahead. All right, thank you. We now return to the News Conference Theater. So, I wanted to ask Dr. Reimer, Quebec has uh, instituted, or they plan to institute a vaccine ta uh, tax. Is this kind of negative reinforcement an effective way at getting people to choose to be vaccinated? Yeah, I mean, that's a really challenging question. I haven't reviewed the science on something specifically like um, a tax for uh, implications on how well it, it would encourage people to get vaccinated. We do know that um, there are some you know, negative reinforcement tactics that are very effective, but finances don't uh, tend to be one of those that are particularly effective. But uh, in regard, it can be quite different depending on how things are implemented. So I really just would have to look uh, to see if there's even any um, scientific assessment of whether or not uh, what they're proposing might increase uh, vaccine uptake. Dr. Atwal, uh, you've had a week now to pour over the modeling numbers. When will we see that publicly and, and what is the modeling telling us right now? So uh, we had an updated model uh, last week. Uh, there were some issues with that model. We had another updated model we looked at this morning. There's still some issues with it. Omicron has put a twist in it in relation to looking at severity and has to get incorporated within the model. Obviously, we see lots of transmission. Our case numbers going up uh, um, on an, you know, for at least the next two, you know, seven days to 14 days and looking at a decline likely there afterwards. I don't have anything to share with you at the present time just because I, the modeling isn't that accurate in relation to severe outcomes at this point uh, from the analysis that we have. So once we look at getting a model that shores that information up to make sure that we are providing um, um, valid, legitimate information based on the most uh, recent evidence that we have, I think we should be able to provide something to the public. How far do you expect uh, ICU capacity to be stretched, uh, given that we're a couple of weeks out from a decline in cases? Um, how, how high is ICU demand going to be, and uh, how, how soon will that happen? I think we're going to continue to see ICU numbers increase, uh, the extent of which is that question mark. And again, those variables there, we don't have a, a, um, a good understanding of those variables for a model basis. I think hospitalizations will continue to increase as well. Once we're able to tease out some of those true hospitalization numbers that we have that are legitimately COVID related versus just COVID incidental, and there's still one or two admissions in the ICU that would be related the same way, that input there into the model should provide us some better, uh, would provide us better knowledge and, and predictions uh, going forward as well. So again, it'll take some time to tease that information out uh, from chart reviews that are underway at the present time. Contingency plans to ship patients to other provinces or, or states if our ICU capacity, given that we're already above 100, we expect the numbers to climb. Are we, are we close to shipping uh, patients out to other provinces or states? I think what we're looking at is increasing the ICU capacity here. That's one of the reasons why the, the reason for the, the, the capacity and the way that we increase the capacity is by getting more nurses into the system. So that's what we're working diligently. I know the minister met with uh, Darlene Jackson earlier this week uh, with, um, from the Manitoba Nurses Union to ensure that we get those internationally educated nurses, some of whom are working within the system now in other capacities, but get them the licenses that they need to ensure that we can increase that capacity in ICU. We have also so in the last 10 months, we have um, 
Uh, we have licensed, I think, more. It was uh, almost 150 um, new uh, nurses for, for ICU, as well as uh, more recently, uh, 70 have been trained uh, for that as well. And so that's how we increase capacity in the system, is ensuring that we have more nurses. We had 13, over 1,300 internationally educated nurses that qualify. Right now, um, other provinces have less stringent rules to get licensed. We need to look at those. We need to break down the barriers, which, which is exactly what we're working with the Manitoba Nurses Union on uh, right now to ensure that uh, with the college, to ensure that the college will uh, break down those barriers to get those nurses licensed. Once we do that, that's our priority right now to ensure that we increase the capacity within the system. But realistically, in the next week or two, as shared health tells us the capacity fluctuates yeah. on any given day between 110 and 120 and now we're up at 103 ICU beds occupied today. Realistically, I, 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 you know, of those 1,300, realistically, I want to see as many of those in the next week or two work in the front lines and that's why we're working diligently with the Manitoba Nurses Union to ensure that we make that happen. So we think that that can happen, that will take place. We, I know that Shared Health has also explored other options of, of, uh, of increasing ICU capacity as well and so some of those questions would be better asked of them but certainly you know, we know that these internationally educated nurses is, is absolutely key. Those nurses are here in Manitoba. They've signed up. They want to be, uh, they want to get out there. They want to help and they want to start working. So, how many of them can, will be working a week? Well, if I, yeah, I sure. take that question. So, um, the briefing that I received uh, showed that uh, there's uh, over 90. Uh, nurses, uh, internationally educated nurses that have been going through the process of licensure that could go into the system within the next few days. And uh, as we know, ICU beds is the most staff intensive beds in our health system. So if we are able to get the, these nurses into the system, we open up more beds. So uh, after, uh, I also stated in my comments that we added two beds. Between yesterday and today, we're up to 116. So just think of the possibility we have if we license these individuals that are just on at the, the, the last stage of um, getting their licensure and get them into the system, we create more capacity. Uh, so that is our focus and it's, not, it's just one of the the tools that, that we are using to increase capacity. But our focus, to answer your question, is to ensure Manitobans get care here in Manitoba. Close to home has always been this government's priority and, and that is our discussions when we are talking to leaders in the health system. But it hasn't always been able to have that care here at home. That's why we're one of two provinces that have to ship uh, patients in, front, in ICU to other provinces. So I'm asking whether we've made provisions with adjoining provinces or states uh, to have them accept patients in the coming week or two. Well, we're able to uh, assist our, our Manitobans with the care they need here at home. So there is no need to have those, those discussions. Uh, it, it is our role as, as leadership to ensure Manitobans receive care in their home province. And that is the number one priority. Manitobans want to be here at home with their support system, their family members, their children, their grandchildren, and we are committed to ensuring that happens. And that is the message that I give to the system every time we meet. Come to me with solutions that ensure Manitobans receive the care they need here at, in Manitoba. And they have, they have stepped up to that challenge and we now have 116 ICU beds. And so you're confident that we won't have to ship patients to other provinces or states in the coming weeks? I'm confident that they will continue to bring forward solutions to ensure Manitobans receive care here at home. Can, can I put the VAX tax question to you? What do you think about this idea and at what point would you start considering that as Maybe something we could do in that. I think there's other measures we could probably take before we go to that that step. But I and I think you know we not, we need to encourage as many Manitobans to get vaccinated. I think that there are other ways that that we might be able to do that. We'll certainly have those discussions. Um, you know, as a, as a cabinet, we'll have those discussions with. Uh, 
with public health to see if there's if there's evidence that shows that um, it, they're actually you know that this works to get more people vaccinated. We want to ensure that that we do implement things to encourage more Manitobans to get vaccinated. So obviously we we want to uh, explore those options. Uh, if you can expand, though, on, on your comments about two-thirds of hospital patients not being there because of COVID, uh, if your COVID infection exasperates your heart condition, as an example, arguably you're there because of COVID, uh, some may find that maybe offensive that the, the, the line that two-thirds of people are not there because of COVID. Can, can you expand a little on that point? Uh, and, and I'll leave it to the public health folks to, to add uh, further uh, details, but uh, this is one of the reasons that why we're doing chart reviews, because we have to go chart by chart to really assess why is the patient in hospital, uh, how did COVID contribute to their condition, did it contribute, and what we are able to see is exactly what I reported today, and that is chart reviews. That's not just anecdotal information. Uh, so we are doing chart by chart reviews um, to ensure that when we report and when I come out here and share that information that it is indeed accurate. So analysis is being done at a very detailed level. How do you distinguish between the two? The, the example that Ian gave, which, which, which category would that fall into? How do you decide? Is that a COVID patient or a non-COVID patient? So, for example, if someone comes in for, for, for pre-op because they, they broke their, their ankle, and their ankle is, is going to be um, uh, operated on. And we do pre-op testing and they're COVID positive. The COVID positive didn't lead to their broken ankle. So that, you that? that is the, the t I, I'm sorry? How do you know that? Perhaps they had COVID and they were elderly and they lost their balance and they fell and broke their ankle. Well, that's the level of assess. It was Absolutely. COVID, Absolutely. So, you know, there's a blurred right. line here, isn't there? Well, it's not blurred if you're doing the chart reviews and you're looking specifically at what the injury is and what led to the individual coming into to hospital. So if, if the person was out ice skating and slipped and fell and broke their elbow, uh, and now, now they're in for surgery, and they're they're tested and po they're COVID, and they said they have no symptoms at all, and they're tested and they're COVID positive. So that is some of the analysis that's being done. It's at that granular level. But the COVID may have led to the fall that brought them to the hospital. You know, uh, <laughs> we we can we can assume a lot of things, but. Um, on, on a medic, and I'll let Dr. Atwal comment as well, but we are doing very detailed, not we being me, but uh, the health system is doing very detailed analysis. Physicians are doing this. Um, uh, specialists in the system are doing this. It's not politicians or individuals at the legislative building, and they are providing us with this analysis, and we have to trust their judgment as physicians and as medical leadership in the system. So, I mean, I could just add into that a little bit here. So, we, you know, when these charts are reviewed, they are reviewed. Uh, some instances are very black and white, and some are sort of, hey, did you know COVID exacerbate a certain situation? Let's say, did COVID exacerbate someone who has heart problems that led to congestive heart failure? In the one uh, sample that we have from one hospital, they are differentiating that as well. Uh, so that is incorporated within that one third number. And, and again, you know, this is something that we're just starting. So I know work is being done on that to fine tune exactly what we're collecting and how we're collecting it, where the system is collecting and that work will continue. For sure, nothing is ever 100% in data collection. Let's be quite frank about that. But I, I think when we're looking at data collection and data that's gonna be provided, it's gonna be fairly accurate. It won't be 100% because uh, I think that's nearly impossible to do, but it'll provide a really good reflection on what's actually happening and who's being admitted for what reason within hospitals. So I just have a question about our, our current strategy for managing COVID in the community. So the consequence of this policy is kind of just letting it go move through the community at the rate that it is, is that we see very significant and severe disruptions to critical services. We see the police force in a state of emergency. We see hospitals and health centers shut down. We see personal care homes where our, uh, residents don't get their clothes changed. So we're seeing massive amounts of disruption to people because of this policy, 
kind of going back to what uh, I think Cameron's question was, is this the expectation that Manitobans can have about the quality of their life moving forward, about the services that they can receive from government going forward because of this public health policy? I think it's important to, to state that this is nothing that's unique to Manitoba. It's happening across the country. So in, in every province, regardless of the level of restrictions or not, this is running into our communities and this is why Manitobans need to look after themselves. This is spreading very, very quickly. And so every single Manitoban has to take it upon themselves to protect themselves during this. The government can't protect everybody out there. You know, people have to learn to protect themselves. We have to learn to live with this. Minister Gordon, can you tell us what, what's the bed occupancy for medical beds right now, uh, COVID and non-COVID, in acute care hospitals? Yeah, I, I don't have that information. I'd have to refer you to Shared Health or get that information yeah, from Shared Health. Have you been briefed on that today or I'm yesterday? Sorry? Have you been briefed on that today or yesterday? The bed uh, occupancy for medical beds in, in acute care hospitals, were you briefed on that today or yesterday? Uh, so we are briefed on a variety of issues. On a, As I mentioned before, I could go upstairs after this press conference no, and have a briefing. Uh, so we have been focused on uh, the chart reviews, where we're seeing Omicron uh, turning up, where's Delta, uh, how do we how do we support our health care workers in the system? Uh, so, so the briefings vary. Um, Is that a pretty multiple, important metric, though? Multiple. The, the overall bed occupancy right now in Winnipeg. What is it? Oh, oh, we are. We are. Not just COVID. Are, not we, just COVID I mean, the right, whole right. bed yeah. occupancy for, for, for COVID and non COVID in medical beds in acute care hospitals. Are, are we at 90? Are we at 98? Are we at 100? Yeah, and that over? information, we, we do discuss that as well. Uh, you were referring to today and, and, and yesterday, and I was sharing with you today, we were focused on, on Omicron, Delta, the chart reviews, uh, what we're seeing in terms of the uptick in ICU numbers. So uh, th this, we have many, many discussions. Uh, the, the, the day doesn't end for us. We are working around the clock we, uh, to ensure that we're talking all the time to the system leaders about what is happening, what they see in terms of the changes in, in uh, bed occupancy, um, ICU, pediatrics, right, mental health, addictions. We're talking about the entire system. But you don't know what that is right now? I don't have the number with me, uh, but uh, we can yeah, so refer idea, you to shared are health. Are close to 100%? Are we at over 90%? I, I, I won't guess. I think it's it's best that Shared Health provide the accurate number. Uh, Dr. Atwell, do we know now where Omicron, like is Omicron now in Northern Health, in Northern First Nations, in Southern Health? Last week you were saying it hasn't really spread there. Has that changed? Yeah, so the latest data shows that it has changed where Omicron is the dominant strain in all of our regions. Some of our First Nations communities in Manitoba might still have Delta circulating predominantly because they are, some of them are almost like island communities. So I don't have that detailed information, but from a regional perspective, Omicron is the most dominant strain in all of our regions. Where is Dr. Rusin? Why haven't we seen him for so long? He was unable to come because he had a conflict today, uh, so he should be available in the future though.